call the uh, Transportation Improvement Program workshop to, to order. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for this important topic of transportation. We're going to start first of all by going around the room and everyone uh, saying who they are. So I'm Mary Jo McGuire, Ramsey County Commissioner, District 2. Nicole Fratham, Ramsey County Commissioner, District 1. Rafael Ortega, District 5. Victoria Reinhardt, District 7. Jim McDonough, District 6. Crystal Mattis Castillo, District 3. Ted Schneider, Ramsey County Public Works Director. Joanna Berg, Deputy County Manager. Final Connor, County Manager. Tony Carter, Commissioner, District 4. And then we'll start. How about yeah, our new, new finance, a new CFO. <laughs> Alex, that's a uh, new Ramsey County CFO. Karen Francois, Deputy County Manager, Information Support Director. Police Obeya. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Project Manager with the EPMO. Uh, Rachel Rotten, Project Manager of Public Works. Brad Stokes, Traffic Engineer of Public Works. Melissa Jamrock, Commissioner of Lawyers Office. Brian Isaacson, Public Works. New Shiny Carlson, Benny. Jennifer Guthrie, County Manager's Office. Shannon Brandon, Sergeant Manager. Mm -hmm. Ian Mike Rogers, Transit Project Manager, Public Works. Matt Hill, Commissioner Carter's office. Darren Toll, Commissioner Reiner's office. Thank you. Thanks everyone again for being here and I am going to turn it over to Joanna Berg, our Deputy County Manager. And I am going to in turn turn it right over to Ted. We got a lot to cover today and I know you've got a lot of things you want to talk about. So all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Joanna. <laughs> but first, how long? How long, when do you want to oh, go until or end? Uh, let's see. 1055. Yeah. Believe it or not, I can do it. <laughs> we, we can, um, I think, go till noon. Yeah. Noon, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Commander Reinhardt. I have to leave by no later than 1125. Oh, okay. I have to same um, I have a uh, presentation that I'm going to be giving ah. in White Bear Lake. Okay. So, but okay. So, we'll miss you. But I. But we have for this for this yes. work. We'll have till noon. Um, well, Mary Jo, I'm, I'll be out at 11, but same time. Same time. Yep. Well, all right. Get all the most important things. Yeah. Well, we'll. Yeah. Okay. We'll get going. Yeah, so the, the so noted. So noted. We'll have a discussion <laughs> when when stuff. they're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Madam Chair Commissioners, thank you. Um, that's our agenda up there. We're going to go through a similar uh, kind of process that we went through last time we met with you. Similar discussion about what we did the previous year, what's coming up in the upcoming year, talk about the bigger one throughout the five years, and then really talk about those themes and discussions that are kind of driving what's in the TIP. Um, the tip affects our entire business within public works. Everything that we are doing, um, it sets the stage for what we're planning, what we're designing, what we're building, uh, what we're maintaining, operating, and funding. It really touches all aspects of, of public works. Um, in essence, it's, it's us putting a, a, our money, our mouth where our, what is that? Putting our money where our mouth is. God, I can't even say it. Um, what I makes us work. Well, well, it's, it's, it's start over. Um, what I, what I do want to recognize here over the past year is that um, your support has meant a lot to us. Um, you've been very vocal at county board meetings in addressing different areas of our business, and I am I am fortunate enough to be down at the board meeting to see that and hear that. But uh, my staff doesn't get to see that and hear that very often. So what, I, what I'll say is um, what I, communications helped us out with this and we put together a, like a two or three minute video of just clips oh, wow. of the things that you guys say and the different oh, aspects and we brought yikes. them to our holiday party and we showed that to them. <laughs> no. Super appreciative. Well, it was, great. You know, it was again, it's, it, it's, it's one thing for me to come in front of them and say that they see me every day, they see me back there. <laughs> It's another thing for you as the elected officials within our organization to hear it directly from you. So they really appreciate um, those sentiments from them. So um, what I will also say in case I forget at the end of this, um, if you want to know more about the projects in your district, call me. We'll bring up project managers. We'll bring up people. We'll come sit down with you and go through uh, them with you so you understand that better. So let's get into this. Um, system overview. You've probably seen this many, many times for those of you that have been here before. 
We have 293 center lane miles, 842 lane miles. That's again adding in when you have four lane roads, four lane multi uh, divided roadways. Average ADT is about 9,500. Um, when I was in my role in state aid and doing around the, around the state type of stuff, 9,500 would be a road that would be out of the ordinary for many, many counties out there. So we are in a heavily urban county that has a lot of cars on it, a lot of activity on it. Um, so we are unique in that standpoint from the number of vehicles that we have out there. 57 bridges that we own, that we maintain, that we operate throughout the county. 297 miles of sidewalks and trails along our county roads. So again, that's a slow build out of that system that we have out there. 21 miles of bike lanes. Um, that one is again over the past five years just been progressively growing when we do our pavement <coughs> our reservation projects. 30,000 signs, 350, uh, 65 traffic signals that are all timed incorrectly according to anybody who drives through them. Um, 9,000 drainage structures. Those are the things you don't see that the motoring public doesn't see. Water has to go somewhere. It goes down a hole and it disappears somewhere. Well, eventually we gotta take care of that, maintain it, replace it. And then what is different about this uh, tip that we put this year is we brought the transit ways into it. We brought the capital aspects of them. So the four that we have, Green Line, Gold Line, Rush Line, and Riverview. Let's talk about our money. These are our regular funding streams of money. We have the county state aid highway construction account, the wheelage tax, uh, the county capital improvement program, those bond funds that are allocated towards our pavement preservation program. Uh, we get a portion of the flexible highway account funds that come out of the highway user tax distribution fund, about $1.1 million. And then we have a regional rail uh, authority levy that goes towards uh, the capital side of our business and then the transit sales tax that goes explicitly towards our transit ways. Um, Commissioner Carter, excuse me. Does the transit sales tax also include the excise tax? Yes, Here. yes, it includes both of those. Adding those up, if you take those first three, the county state aid highway uh, account, the wheelage tax, and the county capital improvement program, those are typically the regular funds year in and year out that go towards our, I'll say our traditional road, bridge, trail, sidewalk type improvements, that's about $22 million annually. The, uh, the re regional railroad or the transit waste side of this business, that's about $50 million annually. Um, and that's something that uh, a couple months ago we talked, walked through with you with the portfolio of transit projects, kind of understanding that long range picture of our transit ways and the funding associated with them. And that's another thing that we will do annually with you in addition to the TIP. Then the item in here that sometimes gets uh, forgotten is we have other partners. So we have our cost participation policy that we have with the cities or we're partnering with MnDOT uh, or watersheds on these different projects to deliver it. So in any given year, that's you know two and a half to $5 million that they're contributing to uh, important projects within uh, Ramsey County. And then the other ones where we're either submitting applications or we are at the state legislature asking for bond funds those are also critical elements that help uh, fund our transportation system. So we look at the whole picture here over the five years. This next slide kind of identifies if we split out those road bridges, sidewalks, and then we split out transit ways, um, road bridges, sidewalks, it's about 50 million per year that we're delivering. This includes our planning and design, right away acquisition, and our construction activities associated with the transportation improvement program. So it's not just construction, it includes those three elements. Transit ways, again, that's our um, anticipated <coughs> costs as we move through forward through the years. You'll see the big jump in 2022, that's the start of Gold Line construction. 2024, it jumps again, that's the start of Rush Line uh, construction. So we have some big aspects coming forward uh, within our transportation program within the next five years. You go to that bottom right corner, that's about a billion dollars that are uh, at some point you are moving in the transportation industry in Ramsey County. So I'm gonna explain this one just a little bit because I, I think it's important to, to understand where we are. Um, so um, as we look at our reg rev regular revenue streams coming into us, and we look at the costs that those pay for. So that first line up there, that road, bridges, sidewalks, costs, 
are the costs that our county state aid highway wheelage tax and county bond funds pay for that would pay for in the tip that is the new hand up there is that so, yes i apologize for that when i was oh. putting the original oh. one together i couldn't do math oh, okay. <laughs> um, so the new one, so this is identifying those costs that we directly pay for out of those funds and the amount of funding that we have available from those funds. So if we look at that year in, year in and year out, um, and then we get to that very bottom right corner, our TIP is currently over-programmed with those funds that are available to us. We have more projects, more costs in there than we can currently fund with those revenue streams. So now what that brings into play is a couple different alternatives for us. One, we look at rescoping projects. We look at projects, you know, is that the right fix? Can we change the scope on that? Um, can we reduce it? Or the other way, do we have a project in there where we're getting asked to do more and we just have to say no because, again, we're in a place where we don't have funding available to do what we're currently doing right now. So that's one step. The other one is we talked about um, the state bond funds or federal funds. We look for outside revenue sources. We look for those regional solicitation dollars. We go to the legislature and say, this is a high priority for us. Can you help us fund this uh, more on a regional level? The regional solicitation is out right now. We have projects that we are identifying in that. Um, so that will help that funding stream as we look at that. And then the third one is look for ways to increase funding. So whether that's a new transportation bill um, or whatever comes out of that. The other one that we have in our platform is adding us or including us into the motor vehicle lease sales tax. If we were to go in as is and not worry about reduction in our population or anything just plunk us in and use the formula as it is right now that'd be about another six million dollars that would come our way so you add six million over five our um, mm -hmm. over programming goes away Ted if I could just add one point to this slide uh, this was a big one that we added because I wanted everybody to have an accurate perspective on what we see in terms of the Delta right now. I think we often talk about the program and where we sit, but there's also a lot of conversations in other jurisdictions about infrastructure backlogs and needs and what they look like. And these numbers both feel manageable right now, but it underscores the importance of some of the revenue work at the state going on and that legislative work. And um, this was an important opportunity to highlight that. And so, uh, it's just a conversation I want to keep in front of you as a board so you can see the most accurate representation. It's always tough to get to those numbers because they can move so much, but I really do appreciate Ted for working on it to bring it forward today. Commissioner Carter, and I appreciate this as well, and certainly the correction that we have before us, and the options that we have in terms of looking for <coughs> additional revenue to support our program. I am wondering about the regional solicitation that you mentioned today. Is that, will that be potentially for multiple years or is that a year at a time? The question you're asked, so the regional solicitation comes out every two years. Yeah. And so we identify projects that we think are going to compete well uh, against other similar types of projects. And the funding is for two years. It will be for one year. So basically we year. say that we have a project out there and we're requesting $5 million for that project and they award it, we'll get it out in 2024 or something like that, out in future years. Thank you. So it doesn't solve the shortage no. over a program period. So let's talk about real quickly about our 2019 projects. It, when it, the interesting thing for me, in any, anyways, when I look at a map like this and I look up there, I'm like, ah, it doesn't look like we're doing a lot. But there is a lot of uh, activity on that map. Um, the green color around there is our pavement preservation project, so that's our mill and overlays. are basically just taking the pavement, replacing the pavement, putting down new pavement, and then that's where we have the opportunity to restripe it, to add bike lanes, to um, add uh, pedestrian crossings, those type of minor fixes, but we're typically not getting outside the curb, adding sidewalk, um, fixing big things with storm sewer, those types of things. Um, on this map, we had two major uh, reconstruction projects that we were the lead for, County Road C and 694 and Rice, and I'll, I'll show those a little bit later here. And then the other red ones that you see on here, those are primarily uh, bike, trail, uh, sidewalk type improvements. 
And a lot of those are led by our local partners. So we're a partner in that, just showing them on this map to, to recognize that, you know, this is a partnership and we're investing in those areas. Next slide is really just a summary of these projects. County Road C on the western end of Roseville. We replaced a concrete road out there with another concrete road. It's a heavy industrial area, um, and so very heavy truck traffic. Placing signal, uh, signals along there. One of the key elements in this is actually putting a trail along that, in which that trail, the importance of that trail is there is a missing gap in there from um, basically, I'll say 35W going to the west and connecting into then the Minneapolis trail system, which ultimately can bring you down into Minneapolis. So great connection from a, a pedestrian bike use. And Race, if I could just yeah. um, interject here, I've driven that. I'm so excited that there's a path because it's it just stops into this industrial area, so that's really great. But this is, some of you may remember, I read a letter from St. Anthony Village. This is part of that work that they were so excited. They were just so grateful about how we managed that work in Roseville as well. So just thank you for that. Yep. Um, that worked there. The other big one is 694 and Rice, placing the interchange, three new bridges, three roundabouts, a lot of activity there, a lot of stuff going on there. Um, there was so much we, we couldn't finish construction last season. Um, and, and again, if you look at it, sometimes people can say, well, why didn't the contractor work? Contractor was out there every day that they could be out there. I mean, it was a lot of work to fit into a short amount of time, and it made sense to not force something to happen to. Um, possibly get a worse product out there. You start constructing stuff late in the season, it gets cold, you gotta do things differently, start throwing salt on it before it's cured. Um, we, we need that bridge to last us 80, 90, 100 years. And so we made the decision to not force that schedule to happen. And so they started construction probably two weeks ago, um, getting back those piers and that last bridge that's out there. Pavement preservation side, again, this is an opportunity for us to fix those pavement, that pavement that's out there. Um, we have a current performance measure out there regarding our pavement quality index. This is our way of um, addressing that pavement quality. Like I said, it gives us the ability then to um, look at those other aspects and bring in that policy of the All Abilities Transportation Network and say, hey, we're, we're replacing the pavement. How do, we know, how do we now start looking at those roads through that lens? You know what? There's options that we can do, whether that's putting bike lanes in. But you'll see the last two in the, the kind of two main bullets is that it's an opportunity for us to replace traffic signals that are they're old, but they're also not ADA accessible. They don't have the push buttons. They don't have the, the tones. They don't have the tactile sense to them for anybody who's uh, disabled. And then that last one there, it's, it's a minor thing. But again, this is us continuing to make our system compliant and accessible for those who have some sort of disability out there replacing those pedestrian ramps. So we'll show some pictures here. This is Edgerton uh, Road, Mill and Overlay. That's where we took the shoulders and converted them to bike facility, bike lanes along them. Concrete rehab. We had several uh, county roads that were um, done in concrete, let's say 15, 20 years ago. They are coming to that period where they're, you know, they're starting to show their age. So putting a major reinvestment in uh, concrete repair will again put these out there for another 15 to 20 years without us having to do significant work out there. This was the County Road C project. Like I said, heavy industrial area. Big equipment out there, replacing the whole road is a full reconstruction, brand new white concrete going back out there. And then, like I said, last one was our 694 and Rice Street project. We had the consultant go out there and do some drone footage. That's the beauty of drone footage now, is you can relatively easily, quickly get out there and see these things from a different spec perspective. If you're orienting yourself, you're looking a little bit southwest. Uh, that's back into Lake Owasso. So that's the north roundabout that takes both ramps at one location. The other thing that we did this uh, past summer was do two pilot projects again. One, uh, an extension of Maryland from Arkwright to Payne, and one then done on Larpenter Avenue from Dale over to Rice Street. If you look at that bottom right picture, that Dale to Rice Street, you would not have seen that uh, a year ago. You would not have seen uh, kids walking across that road, vehicles stopped. Um, with that pedestrian refuge there. Um, what I, one thing to highlight in here, this is the background stuff that you may not see or may not know about. All that work was done by our internal forces. Our maintenance staff went out there, 
our design staff were out there, our traffic engineer was out there, out there making sure that what we're putting out there meets a, a standard, meets a design criteria, um, and that we have our own maintenance forces going out there and doing it. Yeah, can I? Yeah, so Commissioner Madison. I know you've heard me talk about this a lot. Yeah. It is awesome. It really is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank People you. are so excited. In fact, now everyone, Dale to the West says, when, when's our turn? Dale Sweet wants it. Well, you're doing such great work so quickly, mm -hmm. responding to the needs. You know, we had pedestrian fatalities, which motivated us to take care of this. Uh, this, the LARP under, there's the Community School of Excellence has 600 students at that school that live in the area. Plus, the, this really has leveraged the partnership with Roseville, the city of Roseville. They're putting in lighting fixtures. We've added sidewalks with the city of St. Paul. So our work and leadership on this has really moved that core team, you know, on the edges of our community to work together. So this is more than just about roads. It's our economic development. It's thriving community. So again, I will keep praising Public Works. And, and I stopped several times when the guys were out working to thank them because they really, really are doing a great job. And, and this picture doesn't show, but there's lots of multiple dwelling houses. I yes. mean, there's lots yes. of apartments on both sides of, yeah. of this in, of, as you move further toward Rice Street. So, yes, kudos, kudos on that, on that really important work. work. And Commissioner yeah. Fretham. I'll just add that I, I was at my office hours this weekend and had someone come up in Commissioner McDonough's district and said, I just love Maryland. Love what you did on Maryland. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. I will I pass that along. Yeah. Those two roads will be permanently converted to three lanes this upcoming construction season. So that is the next step in that. So 2020 projects. This is what's going to be in your kitchen this uh, summer. Um, this is uh, the good and the bad that comes along with doing work is you got construction activity. You got lanes reduced. You got dust. You got dirt. You got uh, just all kinds of different stuff going on in here. So we, we have in this program for this year, we have three reconstruction projects. Um, and I'll highlight those um, in the next few slides. We have 15 different pavement preservation locations. We're doing about six and a half to seven miles of bike lanes on those. And so again, continuing to expand that uh, the ability for a bicyclist to have a contiguous long distance trip uh, on our transportation system. When we complete, when we so one of the roads that we are um, doing a pavement preservation job on and restriping is Energy Park Drive. When Energy, Energy Park Drive gets completed, you'll be able to go from St. Paul all the way up to the um, Hennepin County border beyond 280 in the bike facility, the bike lane. So we have that continuous stretch now going out there the whole way. So it's that slow build of the system, it's that consistent build of the system that's gonna make this kind of a complete network at some point. Um, we have eight different sidewalk and trail projects, various stormwater projects. We're getting more active in that. Um, water treatment, water quality, water rates, water maintenance is becoming a higher and higher uh, topic out there in the community. And so we are going after those a little more aggressively with our program. And then last but not least is the, the three transit ways that continue to move forward. Our Gold Line, Rush Line, and Riverview and all the activities that, that go along with them. What I will highlight here is within the next month, we have about 10 different community events in different projects. So it's not just on 2020, it's on future projects too. So this next month is gonna be very active for our, our project managers back here who are out doing open houses or community meetings or community gatherings or one-on-one -on -one conversations with business leaders just um, with the various projects that we have uh, going on right now. One thing that you will also see here in this tip that we did a little bit differently is we have, I'll say, broken it up to be a little more um, transparent and easily understood in the types of projects that we're doing. So we call things construction, we call them pavement preservation, we call them pet and bike, we call them stormwater, so that if somebody picks this document up, it's not just all one color showing projects. It gives them a little more understanding of what we're going to be doing and what the impact could be. So let's highlight a few of these. Lexington Parkway at West 7th Street, this is a realignment, getting rid of that fifth leg at Lexington, Montreal, West 7th. Um, the leg that we're getting rid of, it's gonna be a cul-de-sac there, that's being turned back to the city, we worked that out with them, we're realigning it with them. Um, the developer has been phenomenal to work with that bought that old school property, it's been a great <coughs> partnership with them. 
They've been very supportive. The businesses on the south side have been very uh, good to work with too. Um, so that work is going to be happening this year um, associated with that, a new signal there, removing the signal at Albion. Future project is going to connect to the south. So that's in the tip in the future. That's a project that we have federal funds for. So the extensions to the bottom where it stops <coughs> yellow, there's a future road that's going to connect down there to Elway and ultimately connect down to uh, Shepherd Road down there. When that connection is made there, Lexington Parkway, Lexington Avenue will be continuous from our very southern road all the way up to our very northern road. I think that's the only road that we have in the county that goes the whole distance. Wow. Well, Commissioner Ortega. Ted, does that eliminate that three-way lights, four-way light, whatever it is? At Montreal. At Lexington. Montreal. Yep, so it's just going to be a four-legged intersection now. Okay, that's great. Yes. Yeah. 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 The other thing associated with this, again, the, the nuances to this, um, signals that are being included or revised at um, the Montreal, Lexington, they're all being upgraded to be accessible and the pedestrian ramps and everything's being uh, ADA accessible compliant. Dale in 94, Commissioner Kirk. Oh, Commissioner McDonough. So, just a quick question, kind of back to the all of Delphi's piece here. So when we're doing the new signals, are we doing the leading blocks on these? Because that's a big piece of this, right? Mm -hmm. Is that just like an automatic? Yeah. Everyone's getting the leading blocks. We are doing the leading pedestrian here. I'll, I'll use the correct terminology. Yes. Yeah. So we're getting them out in yeah. front. I, it's not, you probably can't see it on here, but there are bike lanes associated with this too. Again, providing that continuity from, you know, you got a national park system at Shepherd. And those bike lanes are continuing all the way up. I don't know. I can't remember how far they go into uh, St. Paul, but continuing north through there. What's the correct? What's the correct terminology? Leading pedestrian interval. Okay. And what does? And then what that does, yeah. and it's yeah. really important, is you get a walk before they get a green, because the right mm -hmm. and then say that these right turns from running over. Yes. yes. Because as soon as a green, yes. they're turning right, and you're standing there, and you're in danger. Yeah. Walk comes on, they still have a red, so you actually are in the intersection before they get. So to yes, Commissioner Ortega. It's a, I'm just, you know, especially people that don't walk a lot, mm -hmm. that is a, a little confusing for folks at times. So I'm just wondering, Ted, if there's an educational piece. Because I've been with folks, and they said, what's this all about? So i got to explain it to them. But it dawns on me that uh, we somehow have to educate the public about, about that. Okay. I don't know of anything out there in explicitly for it. I don't either, I and I don't know what you could do about it either. It, yeah. it, I was just curious that on several events, they, there are people that are really not familiar with it because mm -hmm. they're in the car most of the time. Right. Commissioner McDonough. Yeah, and you know, that might just be a piece where you're doing your community engagement, and that's happening. Good point. Part yeah. of your presentation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is going to be included, and mm -hmm. not just the subject that people understand what it is. Yeah. Or even a little sign. I thought that would be expensive. Okay, thank you. Dale in 94, uh, like I was saying, Commissioner Carter uh, yeah. pulled this one out of the county board meeting to talk about it. it. There's been a ton of work done on this. You've probably heard about it over and over. And I, I don't want to downplay it, but I, I think <coughs> you've heard enough about all the activities and all the work that has gone out there for this project. Um, starting March 23rd, the ramps on the east side of the bridge are going to be closed and contractors are going to start rolling quickly. They're going to cut the bridge in half, they're going to keep access during construction allowing vehicles to get still north and south on Dale Street while one half of the bridge is being built. When that bridge gets, uh, the new bridge gets built, they'll flip it, cut the other half, tear the other half down and start building from there. So continuing to maintain that connection through there. This, I'll say from a construction disruption standpoint, it's going to be huge. You're in the middle of uh, St. Paul, you're tearing down an interstate bridge, it's going to be big. And so we're working very closely with our communications people. Uh, this, is, this is probably the first time in a project where we have uh, brought in a community liaison person during construction so that we have somebody more boots on the ground um, that is uh, focused, I'll say, on the community engagement side of it so that they have a person to go to and talk with as opposed to drive, try and grab a construction worker or an inspector or somebody off the job when, when other activities are going on. 
Yeah, this is definitely outreach. Yes. Just them calling us. Yeah, absolutely. So I can, I'm going to ask this question now, um, Ted. I could ask it any time, but do we? I think we do, but do we always have uh, signs up that says, you know, here's what we're doing, here's the estimated time that we're going to be done, here's you know why we're doing it. I mean, I, I just have noticed that in other places that that that's really helpful and it helps people when they're sitting in traffic. So like, okay, I get it, we want to do this. I mean, I just think the more that we can um, let people know what we're doing, you know, it's, it's just really helpful. You know, we, we want to make it more really accessible. I mean, give them some of our good reasons. I mean, it, it's on a poster, but we can work with, you know, our communications people on that. But I just think as much as we can let the public know, they're much more understanding. Okay. Thanks. The signs are out. Are they? Undale, yeah. Undale. Undale. Okay, yes. good. So good. most of our major reconstruction projects, we're going to put a changeable message sign letting them know something okay, is coming. Good. Okay, we'll Get that out ahead of time. Okay. Um, I would say it's probably not as regular where we'll put, I'll say, that black lettering on orange saying, this construction project's being led by Ramsey County. Go to this website if you want more information. That's mm -hmm. something that we can look at from yeah. a communication standpoint. And I think it's good to show their tax dollars that way. Last one I'm going to highlight here is the Riverview Corridor. Um, this one has, I'll say, maybe not been, it, it's just been maybe a little dormant for the past couple of years. Not to say there's not activity been going on, but we have four RFPs out on the street right now that we are going to get very back engaged in this corridor, very active in this corridor very quickly. And um, just letting you know that that's going to be coming, and so there's going to be a lot more discussion about what's going on at Riverview. If we put Riverview in kind of comparison to where Gold Line and Rush Line are, Riverview is starting its early preliminary engineering and environmental work compared to the other two. Um, as long as I'm on this slide, I'm going to just take a little quick right turn here and just talk really brief, briefly about Gold Line and just give you a quick update. If you recall kind of the last communication that came from uh, Brian Isaacson back there regarding the Gold Line and the rating. At the time, we were um, aware that the rating was going to come out and Gold Line was going to be a medium low. Um, we have, with the Gold Line Project Office and our other partners, Washington County, we've been working on the technical aspects um, that FTA kind of suggested we look at and we examine and reassess and relook at. Um, and I'm, we're happy to say that um, we have done that work, we have done that technical look. And by adding and including additional parking space, parking availability, that increases the potential for more riders. That then moved us, has moved us back into a medium high rating. It is unofficial, and we won't get that notice until we move into the, uh, what do we call it, engineering phase? Yes. Engineering phase. But as of right now, the indications are coming out of FTA that we have moved up in our rating for Yay. Gold Line. For our future yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Staff have worked very hard on yes. this, so appreciate that. Congratulations. Yes. Let's do this real quick. Let's fly through 2020 to 24. These we're going to highlight just our reconstruction projects, so the big ones that are out there. We'll just keep flagging them there. That's our Dale 94. That is our uh, West 7th and Lexington job. That is County Road D up in Little Canada. That's the first phase of the work that Little Canada is leading. Mm -hmm. That is uh, Cleveland Avenue by the U of M St. Paul campus. That is our second piece of County Road D that we're working with Little Canada on, reconstructing that road. That is uh, 35E County Road J work. That's Hodgson up in Shoreview. That is County Road, or I'm sorry, that's Lexington Avenue just south of 694 in Shoreview and Arden Hills. That is the extension of Lexington Parkway down to Shepherd. That is um, Otter Lake Road north of Kassan 96, County Highway 96, adding a trail along there. That's a big one for us. And I feel like that's something, but I can't think of what it is right now. Rice Street. Rice Street. Yeah. <laughs> That's Rice Street reconstruction. <laughs> That's a big one that we're working yeah, on. <laughs> that is our South Shore Boulevard work. That's Gold Line construction coming in 2022. That's um, Rush Line in 2024. So a lot of stars over a lot of this county doing a lot of reconstruction stuff. So again, 
as we look at our program, I mean, if you put up five years on there, that's a lot of activity that we have going on from a transportation standpoint. We're going to change those to gold stars. <laughs> <laughs> this is just highlighting what those projects were. Nothing more than that, just for your benefit. So let's talk about themes and direction. Uh, we did this last year with you, too. They're pretty consistent uh, with what we had last year. So let's talk about safety on our, our transfer, for our transportation system. Um, you probably saw this. We're number one. Um, but we're not number one in a good way. We're, we're number one in a way that we don't want to be. Um, if you compare us to the other counties across the whole state here, setting aside, let's set aside Hennepin County, we have twice as high of a crash rate than anybody else in the county or in the state. And so that's a number that we don't like. What I will say, what is good about us is on the fatality and the serious injury sides, we're at the lower end of that. We're pretty good with that. But that crash rate, that's that's a lot of people being affected every day. Um, and so you look at the number there, it's about 16,000 plus crashes a, a year, almost 17,000 crashes per year on our county road system. That's a lot. What's yeah, what, yeah. So they're all round, even 1.2. What do you do to get to green? What's the number? <laughs> I can't remember the number that they use. Brad, is it about one? I think one is the med, the point number eight. where they lower than point eight was that yellow. Was yeah. That was that was the average. So point eight across the system is average crash rate. Hmm. And, so and even as that is, I'm sorry, even as that is, we're four times higher than the average crash rate. Yeah. And that's because we're so concentrated that we our roads are. Funny you should Four ask. <laughs> Let's go right there. Yeah. <laughs> Four lanes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's start this off in, in just more of a, an analogy. There's there's no single raindrop that thinks it causes the flood or it caused the flood. It's no single one action that suddenly puts us at a four times higher crash rate. It's a combination of things. It's a combination of actions. It's a combination of um, just our system that's out there. And we want to highlight a few of them um, so that we can understand them. Four lanes to three lanes. Um, just the most important thing that we would highlight on this is that from a three lane compared to a four lane, it is twice as safe or almost half, twice as less safe. I can't remember, exactly, I can't think of the exact way to phrase it, but you have a higher, twice a higher crash rate on a four lane undivided than a, than a three lane. If you go back to our number of about 17,000 crashes per year, I mean, that you're talking thousands of crashes that potentially can be reduced just by making that change. I should say just, it's not an easy thing to do, but by making that change. Um, last week, Brad Astotian, he uh, presented the study that we're doing at the Minnesota Transportation Conference. The room was packed. They wanted to see what we were doing. And it was, it was a, a combination with City of St. Paul, and other activities that were going on with regarding pedestrian safety and safety on our transportation system, but it was a packed room to kind of hear what we're doing. And I think the thing that I heard from questions that were being asked is they recognize we are pushing boundaries. We are pushing it to a different place than I'll say traditionally has been on these, these roadway systems because we are saying safety is number one and we're prioritizing that. Commissioner McDonough, oh, sorry, Commissioner Ortega and McDonough, I did see you well. Ted, the, uh, do we have specific locations within the county that's pushing up the number? We do. I don't say we have, we don't have it at our fingertips. Yeah, but, but this is this is an activity that we are doing with. We're currently doing a four lane to three lane uh, conversion study. So we're looking at all of our four lane roads, and then um, analyzing them and having crash rate as a part of that. A crash analysis. A look at the crashes. Okay, so then you'll have a better idea of where the hot spots, yes. the key locations, whatever. Yes, we will. You like it? It's Rice Street. Rice Street. <laughs> it's Rice Street. <laughs> yeah. is, is that, but is that carrying those numbers, Rice Street by itself, those big numbers? It can't. I, I, it's systematic. It, it's, it's across the system. The thing. Okay. I mean, granted, if you're in White Bear Township and you're on a road up there, it's not the same as getting down into these four lane, three lane, four lane roads. Right. I would say that the four lane roads are what's really pushing that number high. So, so Commissioner McDonough, then Madison. So, a couple of things, and 
I mean, safety, we already know the impact of kind of the four or the three commitments that we're doing this stuff. Yep. At what point, and we're trying to be bold, I mean, because the first one we did, I mean, we were at 20,000 cars a day, and the mm -hmm. federal government says, absolutely no way. I mean, I challenge anybody to drive down that street again. Mm -hmm. Not long. That's right. So at what point do we actually start getting a good sense of how many miles we can do of these four or three conversions? And how do we fit it into the budget? Because this is this has a big impact mm -hmm. on safety. Relatively cheap, we can do a lot of them. You know, we don't maybe can't do the full overlay, but we can do the stripes. Mm -hmm. And then when we come back five years later, we, do, we can make it permanent. But just doing the striping makes a big deal. So how are we thinking about actually making that into this five-year plan, because I didn't see it in the budget, yep. where we can actually move the needle really quickly for a... Uh, that's a good question. That's a, that's a great question. And actually, that's what we're doing out of the study. So the one thing that we are, are doing as a part of that is, I'll say, creating a, a traffic signal in the sense of green, the things we can change almost immediately. Yellow, we got to look at them a little more thoroughly to understand a little more the dynamic. And then there's the red ones where it's like we, there's bigger things going on here that we really got to kind of dig into a lot more. It's going to take us more work, effort to look at. And so we also have different, I'll say, um, pavement preservation strategies where we don't have to invest the same amount of dollars to get a, I'll say, a um, pavement that's back structurally sound that will buy us life on the pavement, but that will also cover up the, the the striping that's out there and allow us to get new paint down. So that's what that study is really going to come out with is really those recommendations and the costs associated with them so that we can understand how we fit it into our program to move that as fast as we can. I'll use the word that, that Brad has been using. He's like, our goal is to exterminate four lane undivided roads. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, so couple couple of, couple of quick, so what's the timing where we'll get to add it? Um, question and yeah. two comments. One is, one of the most fortunate things, I think, when we actually did the Maryland piece first, <coughs> is that's probably one of your most difficult roads to do. So we've kind of pushed the boundary. Certainly there's going to be some unique situations, and the next one actually probably is MnDOT's coming down Arcade Street, or 61, with their big overdue here. And there's been a lot of conversations about how do we do that, when that starts to intersect intersect with our, our Maryland Street where we've had some of those things. And how does that work with MnDOT relate to the timing on the study you're doing because I don't want to miss the opportunity to have the conversation here where MnDOT's actually leading that project but it has a really big impact in it. Mm -hmm. The study should be coming out in June. Uh, that's when we're anticipating June, July. Okay. So that's when we're anticipating having the results of it uh, so that we understand that picture better. As far as arcade, um, we'll continue to push on MnDOT yeah. to say that it can be done, it should be done. Good. And I think the opportunity there to really look at how does that intersection work, because that's probably, mm -hmm. the, you got two potential yeah. four threes coming together, and how do you actually make a really dumb, difficult intersection maybe actually even work better when you can do it all, all four legs on that. So. Yeah. Okay. I guess I just wanted to comment on the what roads making it really dangerous and Rice Street. I think we just heard from our consultants that are working on Rice Street that it's the most dangerous road in the state. So if you think about that, the cost of doing nothing is not nothing. This has been a very expensive, you know, fill in potholes project. And so um, I'm super excited about the work. When we're talking about uh, Arcade and MnDOT, did you include Snelling on that in safety? Things as we know, Snelling is incredibly dangerous. We've had another uh, hit and run there, right, in the family. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. and and I'm with Jim. Like we can't we can't do this conversion fast enough. I know I keep telling you, Dale, Dale, Dale. I have residents that are like, please, please, that yep. there might go rogue striping soon. So yep. we're coming oh, <laughs> to June. Um, they desperately Psycho. want it for free. So oh, that's so great. That's a lot of spray paint, kids. <laughs> <laughs> might, might be able to take a collection. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, county manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of thoughts. I kind of responded to the previous two comments and questions. I, from a, I do think it is important that we get the system wise. I know the urgency. 
and there's a lot of people with eyes on it, it'll be important as we move forward, both from being a leader outside this county and within it on the rationale of why it matters to have it. And for engineers, I think it matters to have that. Mm -hmm. So June, June is thankfully coming soon. Of course, it was the first question I also asked Ted when we did the walkthrough for the workshop. So I can't say I fault you for asking it because it's what I want to do too. Um, on the question about the funding piece, we haven't really gotten to that conversation yet. It'll be something that'll come up more. I'll just tie you back a little bit here to some other spots. And I, you know, there, we have a number of different spots where we're going to be challenged on the funding side, but these are not ongoing operational things. And so we got to think about where we might tap resources in a different way. To restripe roads could be a one time thing, and then you put them back into your program going forward as a part of the long term maintenance piece. And so, because it's not an ongoing financing stream, we've got to be just thoughtful about where we might approach that and how we might do that. It opens up some different vehicles for us to do it. I do not think, you know, restriping roads should not be something that constrains us on the budget side for an organization of our size and complexity, particularly if the safety warrants it. And then the only last thing I want to continue to just say out loud is, 4-3 is a big deal, but it doesn't get us the whole way to an all abilities network either. And I think that's just important for us to keep saying it. I want to say it out loud so we all hear it. Yeah. Um, it's a huge step, and I don't in any way mean to diminish it, and it's a big deal to leave there, and I really appreciate the department, but um, it's just a step along a bigger journey. Well, I, 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 I will, I totally agree with you, it doesn't get us all the way, but I will tell you that the 4-3 uh, partner has now allowed safe usage for many people in wheelchairs, because there isn't currently a sidewalk on the south side, and I frequently see people, because it's a protected, very wide bike lane, they can now travel safely. That never happened before. For sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, going with systematic kind of safety contributors, access management. This is a topic that's been out there for years and years and years. It's the, it's the do we provide access or let the development go? Do we restrict it? Do we keep it? I'll say from a purely data standpoint, what we do know from the data side, every access point makes the road less safe. It, 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 it just does, and I, I'm not arguing for or against it. And this is the balance that we, we bring into our system of, we have the safety of our road users, but yet we as a county are also proponents and encouraging economic development and redevelopment. And so um, this past fall, actually on um, Halloween, we pulled together um, an access management summit um, with engineers, planners, economic development directors, got in a room, talked about what our concerns and issues and questions were. And um, from that work, Brad Stoshin, Brad gets all the, all the monkeys on his back that he's uh, carrying here with the difficult stuff. He's working with some of our city partners, whether it's uh, the city engineers or their planners to um, develop and implement um, access management guidelines or policy. So you may see that coming forward again to you in the future. Like the roundabout help too. Ooh. And then the last one that we want to highlight here again is, is again thinking of this through a proactive lens. Uh, I'll say our history has been when um, somebody calls and says, hey, I need a pedestrian crossing, we go out and look at it. And we go out and say, well, uh, yes, no, it doesn't meet this criteria. Um, Brad and working with public health and active living and others have looked at this through a little bit of different uh, lens, uh, utilizing our GIS data, the data that we have on those factors that are there, and put a point system to them and said, okay, based on all these other factors, so not just head counts or vehicular traffic, what are these other factors that bring in areas where we think more people would walk, could walk, should walk, and it's a barrier because of our transportation system. So this is in its early infancy infancy stage. So this is really us being proactive and looking more strategically at these locations where again, we should be investing our dollars because of the need in those areas. Mm -hmm. Ted, on, on the pedestrian crossing, so I'm sure I'm not alone when I get um, requests for those lit signs, you know, you push the button and then the pedestrian mm -hmm. lights go off and everything, and you know, lots of people want those. Yeah. And I know St. Anthony put one in themselves, I think, right? Because that it wasn't in, um, I don't know, it was a, a while ago. But um, what, just tell me what the procedure, is that just part of it? Like if it's super high traffic, you might consider a, a lit pedestrian crosswalk or just, and then otherwise it's just a regular crosswalk? So each one has a level. Okay. So, and I'll say right now, there's, there's national guidance out there, there's statewide guidance out there, but one that we're starting to use or implement and follow is more of St. Paul's pedestrian plan and the guidance that they have out there that they established. It, 
They went through a very um, engaged process, an open process, look at all the systems, all the different ways, and utilizing that. So it's really about pedestrian volume, speeds, and traffic. Those are kind of the three criteria that you look at for enhancing the level of, um, uh, I'll say, protection or awareness that you have of pedestrian crossings. There are also times where it's like, no, that is not, we, we, won't, we don't want to put anything out there because we don't want anybody Everybody crossing there. Right. Find a different that's way, that's find a different place. Right. And so that's the last thing that we want to do is encourage crossing at a location that ultimately makes it less safe, less safe because the pedestrian thinks right. it's safe, right. but it's not safe for them to actually use it. Okay, thank you. Moving on to kind of the next area for um, our activities and discussion and highlighting and priorities is really the contracting and workforce inclusion. Um, Lane Becker out of Workforce Solutions came a month or so ago and talked about the efforts that I'll say uh, we in the EGCI are doing on this and so I don't know if I really need to talk about this a lot but it's really just reinforcing that um, Public Works has a big play in this. You, you saw the number, it's $50 million. Just percentage-wise, we have the ability to, to move a needle on this. And saying that we're starting to take small steps, we're starting to be more thoughtful in either the consultants that we are targeting, that we are selecting, or that even if you are a, let's say, a prime consultant, you're the lead consultant, we are, when they come and talk with us about a project, we're saying, here's what we want to see out of your proposal. We want to see SBEs. We want to see representatives from the community. And that's what we've been seeing, I'll say, most recently on two of our proposals is that those consultants are hearing that and they're putting their proposals out that are reflecting that. So part of that is that partnership that we have with them and making sure that we continue to communicate that that is an important um, item for us. Um, one of the big ones is, and, and Ling reported on that, is just the reporting of data. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's scattered right now, or it's hard to get, it's confusing, it's not timely. And so that's a big piece in this. Um, I'll say Workforce Solutions has been phenomenal in this space. They've been a great partner with Lang and John O'Fallon, and just, I'm not a workforce specialist, and just having them and their resources available to us to come and partner with us or work behind the scenes with us on it has just been, been phenomenal. Um, the one thing that we are doing and just highlighting this is uh, job fair participation, the Young Adult Career Academy that again is coming out of workforce. Um, we had the Washington Tech students out there. We are in this all the way. We are fully committed to this, bringing this, them in, um, talking to them about our entire business. The beauty, of, I think, of our business is that we cover everything. We can cover somebody who's a mechanic to an accountant to an engineer and everything in between. And so. We have a broad, diverse of opportunity for people to work within our business. Thank you. And this is just the last one to highlight. Again, integrated planning, it covers so much. And um, I do believe that in Public Works, we are active in this space. We are getting better in this space. We are being more thoughtful in this space. So not only with our own internal departments, but our external, external partners, and all the other kind of, I'll say, all abilities and just bringing that into, I'll say, day in and day out, just normal business. Ongoing items, the four lane, the three lane we talked about, access management we talked about, CERT SBE, asset management is a huge thing for us, huge. It's gonna take years of effort for us to get to a place where asset management is doing what we want it to do. But that is starting with us and parks and property management. Uh, all abilities, transportation, we're continuing to hammer on that one and work on that one. St. Paul maintenance agreements, um, we started that work on them. Since I lost my maintenance engineer, it's kind of slowed down. And so we're kind of, we're getting in that arena with them. And then the one I do want to highlight out of this is really fleet management energy governance. Um, they're not highlighted in this tip. Um, they're, they're part of our operating budget. They do have a capital component of this with purchasing vehicles and uh, equipment. They are integrated across the county. They do everything. Um, we have, I would probably put either the top or one of the top uh, diverse portfolio of fleets and equipment out there uh, for anyone in the state. When you start talking about snow plows and zambonis and golf carts, um, we have a diverse, um, diverse fleets pool. Um, Pat McCoy, who's our fleet manager, has been doing phenomenal in this space. Um, 
he looks at our system day in and day out. He's constantly looking at how he can make it better. Um, just to give you a little bit of statistics here, um, in 2016, we had one electric hybrid vehicle. One, that's four years ago. We now have 43. So very proactive in that space and identifying and meeting our fleet and energy, our, basically our energy governance goals. Um, every time we replace a uh, old snowplow truck, it's becoming more efficient with the one that we're purchasing. So we're making a lot of steps in there. Um, the other area that you, you may have come in contact with is um, there are vendors out there, let's use enterprise fleet systems, kind of saying, hey, we can come in, we can help your fleet, you know, we can, you can lease from us, we have a program. Pat's been talking with them for years. Looking at, okay, what are the pros and cons? Is it cost, value, service? Are you hitting all three of those markers? And right now, in working with them, it just doesn't work for us. We don't get the cost, we don't get the value, we don't get the service that we have out of our fleet system. We'll continue to work with them. We'll continue to look for opportunities to make that better or to find ways that, oh, well, if we, maybe if we carve this out, this will be better. But that's an area that we, Pat is very uh, ingrained in and knows very well and has been working with those outside vendors quite a bit. Commissioner Mattis Castillo. So I just wonder before you jump uh, on, is, and I, I know I prepped you with this question earlier, but maybe it, we can talk about speed limits and how you know the city of St. Paul is reducing speed limits to 25 on their mm -hmm. residential streets. Where do we see us playing in? You know, how do we reduce our speed limits? Especially as we're doing those four three yes. conversions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we probably need to adjust some speed limits as well. So we'll try and do this relatively <laughs> <laughs> uh, quickly here. Yeah. Yeah. So speed limits, the authority to establish a speed limit is through the Commissioner of Transportation. So Lexington Avenue, if we want to change the speed limit, if we don't think that the current speed limit is what it is, you pass a resolution, you say, we want uh, the Commissioner of Transportation to go out and do a speed step. So that's, that's the first one. Then there's other elements, items within the statute that more or less say, if you meet this criteria, you as the local agency of the road authority, you can go change the speed limit. So let's use bike lanes as an example. Bike lanes, um, when you establish an on-street bike lane, we as the road authority, without needing to do an or, or a engineering study, we can go establish the speed limit um, 25 miles an hour or above. And so I'll say that in particular, that's an item that um, we have in Brad's space right now. Um, because again, we're starting to wade into this and with the four lane to three lane study, we're gonna come up with some uh, criteria thoughts as to as we convert these. These are the things that we'll look at and how we'll look at them and why we'll look at them to possibly reducing the speed limit on those ones in particular. Thank you. It's a big, uh, speed limit is a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. McDonough. Um, real quick on the speed limits, but actually there's a lot we can do just to get people to actually. So Maryland, if I remember right. the numbers right, the average speed of the 443 conversion on a 40 yeah. foot right away with four lanes and all the stuff that's going on is 37 miles an hour. Yep. With the 43 conversion, it's actually 31 miles an hour. Right now. Mm -hmm. wow. So we can have an impact mm -hmm. with what we do already for the safety. This is just, a, I want to throw this out there and, you know, maybe more in some conversation about it to Google this, right? So we continue to evolve, and I'm really excited about all this, and we can build and grow on and how we look at this, and, and you, you called out today really the importance of access management and all these things we're doing, and I actually look at the list of the last slide, and you know, it, it's probably, and time just flies, but you know, maybe it's been four years or five years since we actually, you know, moved to this all of Elkies transportation network, right? Guns, transit, cars, freight. But what is the evolution of that, right? Because to me, that's, you know, we've actually, in some ways, moved past that. And, you know, and I think about this, because sometimes, you know, what we say and how we call things and how it pushes us, but what I'm seeing here, and, 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 and you know, just to noodle on it is, you know, really what we're doing here with everything you did is infrastructure for communities. Whether it's access management, whether it's, you know, four three conversions, whether it's pet crossings, they're all infrastructure pieces that help build our communities. And I don't, you know, I just don't want us to lose fact of, okay, so we did all of these transportation five years ago, good, good stuff, we're all happy, and then and we just kind of get 
off, but we still have this fragmentation in some senses and pull together some pieces. But the, we'll go back to your little circle thing here in the integration and what's really truly happening with that integration. Right? Um, I don't know, you know, we talk about the funding piece of some of this stuff. What does it look like if we actually move to an EDA or a community development and flexible dollars to actually help build community, right? So I just throw that out there for us to continue to be thinking about the work we do and, and how we how we label it and and how we approach it and are we actually continuing to be bold and setting us for these striving to versus we've achieved and we're doing good, right? Okay. Okay. Commissioner Fretham and then So for the um, four to three study, that's only looking at four lane roads. Four lane undivided, correct. And so looking at that, but I have a lot of two lanes mm -hmm. go that are undivided and that's kind of motivating a lot of this <coughs> discussion right now. And I know you and I have talked about the challenges in creating <coughs> pedestrian pathways along them because of the stormwater management. Yeah. What other solutions do we have to manage those roads other than lowering the speed limit that could produce safety for the community? Because I think the reason we're not seeing as many accidents or like injuries is that the community has opted out of even walking along that road. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, because we recognize that it's not safe. So are, are there other tools that we have in our basket that could address that other than reducing the speed limit? That is a very good question. And one that I, I don't have an answer to. I mean, it, it's, it's a complicated um, mm -hmm. item because again, these county roads that, let, let's use that uh, Victoria as the, as the example. It's a two lane road, it's been there forever and ever. Mm -hmm. It was originally, you know, a, a rural county road yeah. out in, out nowhere. And it was designed that way to have people go 40, 45 miles an hour on it. Now you have a community that's tucked into it. Mm -hmm. And really that's, that's what I think the effort that is gonna be going on with that statewide task force mm -hmm. regarding speed limits, mm -hmm. it's gonna get after roads like that for us in particular. Is that it's mm -hmm. kind of the outliers that, um, Per a speed study, it may say that it wants to be higher, but per the community and the, the residents or the area that is connected to and around may want us to look at the, a different speed limit for that. Um, one other question I know Commissioner Ortega talked about uh, education around the, the pedestrian interval, but uh, I think we talked a little bit about roundabout education. Um, being on that 694 Rice Street, I've already seen someone drive the wrong way through the roundabout. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's only happened yeah, for a few yeah, weeks. Okay. <laughs> oh my, that was, that was, that was yeah. yep, that was happening. Yeah. Hopefully it wasn't my mother-in-law. Uh, 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 <laughs> well, is this being recorded? She lives there. Um, well, I, I know, I know it's been a kind of a sticky issue in the community because yes. uh, I'm on next door every once in a while oh. um, when I have poor judgment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what, what are we doing to help people understand how to actually use those roundabouts properly? So that's a very good question, another good question. And what I would say is don't use what's out there now as the guidance as to how it should be driven. It's, it's all temporary, it's kind of all okay. shoehorned in, and so it's, it's not gonna look at anything like it is when it's fully constructed. The uh, center medians will be there, the center islands, the circles will be there, there'll be plantings in it. So it will, I'll say, lend itself to the majority of drivers driving it the right way. Um, there are, we have it on our website, so we have videos out there Great. so that somebody can say how to drive a video. I'll say back when I uh, was in Washington County, uh, this is 2006, that was the first video that we did through the local road research board. So there's a, a statewide, uh, research entity that helped put together kind of the first video on how to how to drive around the boat and so there's a lot been done since then that helps people understand how to drive through roundabout so I would guide them back to our website into that Ryzen 694 web page great thank you no, that's great uh, Commissioner Carter and, and our county manager do you want to go before uh, yes. okay. I on this point or do you well no it's not it's oh. on the overall. Oh, okay. Well, that's so. Okay. Do you want to make a comment on this? I'll be very brief, Madam Chair, to this point, but I think it ties in somewhat in an overarching way. What I've seen from the Public Works Department is, you know, we used to have conversations around the infrastructure, education, enforcement, and leave out the infrastructure component and pretend that education and enforcement can get you to what you want. And that conversation happens a lot of places. The good news now, whether it's the leading in, the leading pedestrian indicators. <laughs> 
It's my new one today. Uh, or, or it's on roundabouts and things. It's even when people screw up, though, hopefully the severity of the yeah. screw up is not as significant as in the past. And over time, hopefully that happens. And so I do acknowledge there's a learning curve with all of this, and I know that can be painful, but the, the hope is that everyone gets to go home at night and can grouse about it, as opposed to it being a fatal or extremely serious moment on our roadways. Commissioner Carter. So thank you very much for this overview of the program from 20 to 24, and acknowledging that we have issues with respect to the funding that is available to us to get this work done. It's, um, we just talked about the 25 million that we would be short on just if we're looking at roads and bridges and sidewalks, et cetera. And we'll be looking more deeply, of course, into the transit side of it. Uh, as we look at approving this, and knowing that you have the ability to make changes, to adjust, and to bring this within you know, the actual uh, funding that we will have moving forward. Can you just walk me through what that looks like as we begin to look at this this month to approve the 2020 to 2024, mm -hmm. and as we're looking at funding that we, don't, we haven't all realized, this come back before us, how often, as we will see the adjustments. So um, you'll approve, in, in theory, you'll approve the TIP, or the TIP will be coming to you for approval. Maybe I'll say it that way. Coming to you for approval next Tuesday. And so it will It will have all the projects. It will have all these projects identified in it. So through the resolution that's identified in that TIP, you're granting, I'll say, us the authority to go out and do the work on those projects. Mm -hmm. And so then it's our job to go figure out the funding associated with them to say, oh, no, we got to move these <coughs> funds over here to there. We're going to submit a regional solicitation application for, let's say, Rice Street because it's identified in our TIP. And so we'll look for that funding source. And really, probably, I mean, it'll be an ongoing conversation. You'll know when we're doing these things because we want to tell you that we've gotten money to do deliver projects or we've gotten outside uh, funding. Where you'll really probably see it most next is, uh, I'll say next year when we bring the full tip back. And so, but between now and then, it, we won't you'll disappear and you'll right. still hear from us. You'll still know that we're out there. And as we make changes or as things move, we'll, we'll be letting you know. Thank you. Now, this is a fluid and ongoing mm -hmm. process. I appreciate the work. So I have a question about the Transportation Advisory Board, you know, and that regional solicitation that's going on right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so our, uh, about how many of our projects do we do we go for, you know, regional solicitation on? And are, are some of these going to go for that, or I think which would be in the future also, because um, that money's already been allocated for this year. So can you just talk a little bit about where the TAB money Yep. You know, goes in. I, I'm guessing it's part of all this. But. So it varies from year, from solicitation to solicitation. How many we apply for? Apply for? Because it, if if, if you put a, a, a dollar amount to it, it probably costs five to ten thousand dollars to put an application. Oh, so it's not a cheap thing. Wow. But again, it's all with the intent of uh, addressing a, a major transportation uh, issue on our system. Um, it really depends on how we think they're going to compete. Yeah. We know the criteria. Our staff is very well versed in what that criteria is and out there. Um, so I, I'd say probably this year we probably have seven to eight applications that we're submitting okay. for regional funds, regional solicitation funds. So it ranges everything from uh, spot safety improvement to a we want seven million dollars for County Road J and 35B. I mean, we're kind of running the whole game. Great. That's that's exciting. So thank you for bringing in active living, all abilities, all these things that you're working on. We really appreciate that. Thank you for all of your work and everyone here, all of you that are doing such great work in this. Is there, are there any other comments? Um, no, Commissioner McDonough. I've been resisting this. No, that's the okay. It just doesn't go away, so I guess. Yeah, so that's it. That's okay. Because I'm not, I really don't like to do this or be a part of this, and you guys have been great. But I look at the 20. I look at the list and I look at 2020 to 2024, I look at your 21 to 2024 notable projects. On that slide, there's one project in the city and 10 projects in the province. Mm -hmm. And I know the city, county roads are tough, mm -hmm. right? They're just really tough, they cost more money. Yep. 
but in some cases they need more work desperately because they've been ignored for so many years because it's easy to go to County Road J. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go to County Road D. You got 200 feet of right away and you can come in and do this stuff. And I'm not I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that we need to always be thinking about this as we move forward that um, we can't just avoid the hardest projects. And I know you took you took on White Bear and you've taken on Randolph and you've taken up you're taking on Red Street and these are really big projects and I appreciate that. But I just it was there the whole workshop Mm -hmm. Almost got through it, you but did. I did bring you it up, and I'm trying to be no, respectful about awareness. it. But it's hard to look at these yeah. lists, mm -hmm. look at the stars yeah. on the maps, and go back into my community where I'm getting pounded every day. So I just bring that. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. No, I, I think it's good awareness for all of us. So we're always trying to be mm -hmm. countywide in our in our perspective and countywide in our work. So we said the same thing if it was the other way. So appreciate that. And so yep. noted then. Yep. Um, thanks. I appreciate thanks. it. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing this at a board meeting. Then, but appreciate it. All right. Meeting Thank is adjourned you. if there's no other. Oh, yeah, I should have asked you, Ted. Do you have anything else you want to say? <laughs> He's good. He's good. Sorry, Ted, I didn't even give you the last word. Yeah.